What if instead of conquering an empire, you instead founded your own small country away from everyone else? This has been attempted more times than you think, so much so that we have the concept of micronations. Not to be confused with microstates, which are just tiny countries like San Marino. Micronations are when a single person or tiny group of people try to form a country but lack any sort of international recognition. They don't win independence in a war either. They essentially LARP as a country, but take it very seriously. I've made videos about a couple of these micro-nations in the past, such as the 1972 Republic of Minerva, or the 2004 Gay and Lesbian Kingdom of the Coral Islands. Then, of course, the most famous example is Sealand. There were many Americans who tried this in particular. When the popular narrative of the United States was about people going to a far distant land for a better life where they can make their own rules, it only makes sense that every once in a while a random guy gets inspired by that narrative to try it himself, but at a smaller scale. Just find a foreign land that's small or empty enough to take over, build your new country, and hope that it won't chaotically fall apart within a year or two. Many usually did though. For this video, we're going to go over one of the oldest American attempted micronations, the Islands of Refreshment. While that sounds like the name of some bougie smoothie bar on the beach, it was an attempted micronation in the South Atlantic that lasted for either two or five years depending on how you count it. It was founded by an American named Jonathan Lambert along with his tiny crew in the island of Tristan de Cunha, and we're going to learn about his little adventure. But while that's one fun adventure, another one is brought to you by this video's sponsor, Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus. Yes, I know, 40,000, but that's how they want me to say it. Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus is a fast-paced action game you can enjoy in the palm of your hand. You can choose from over 70 legendary champions from across 17 playable factions and create an army that'll go head-to-head -head against other players in high-stakes battle. You can also use your powerful warriors to compete in multiplayer game modes including PvE campaigns, PvP, guild raids, live events, and so much more. Currently, there's a new event with the Gene Stealer Cult just in time for the Halloween season. If you use the code OCTWELCOME with the link below, you can receive 2,000 coins and 50 blackstone to give yourself a good head start in the game. So download Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus today and fight hard with the top champions on the go-to game for top quality tactical material. Thanks to Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus for sponsoring this video. To better explain Lambert's story, let's go over the brief history of the islands themselves. The islands even to this day are considered one of the most isolated in the world. Even now, you can only get there by ship. The islands were completely uninhabited for most of human history. In 1506, a Portuguese explorer named Tristão de Cunha spotted them, giving the archipelago its name. While there are unverified claims of a Portuguese landing on the islands in 1520, the first confirmed landing was done by a Dutch East India Company ship in 1643. For the next century, the Dutch, Austrians, and a few others, including maybe pirates, would visit the islands, but they never remained inhabited for more than a few days at most. The islands were also never officially claimed. While we usually think of European colonial empires as scrambling to divide up the world as much as they can between them, that hastiness was much more of a late 19th century imperialism thing than 17th century colonialism. Colonies at the end of the day were investments. While people might settle anywhere if they can survive or prosper, from the nation's perspective, if there wasn't a profitable resource or a convenient military base, then it probably wasn't worth putting in the resources and manpower for colonizing in the first place. But eventually the islands did come up on the radar for the British. After the US won its independence, Britain needed a new place for a penal colony. While that would end up being New South Wales and modern day Australia, one of the proposed places was the Tristan de Cunha archipelago. Despite being passed over, in 1789 the British government decided to investigate the islands to see if they were worth colonizing anyway. By 1793 the investigation was complete and reached the answer of no. So the islands remained uninhabited, until Jonathan Lambert came along. Very little is known of Jonathan Lambert's early life other than that he was born in Salem, Massachusetts in 1772 and that his father was a sailor and sometimes he'd be on voyages with him. In 1810, at the age of 38, he did join a U.S. whaling ship named the Grand Turk, so at the very least he had quite a lot of sailing experience. It would make sense that Lambert would be a whaler because many of the more isolated islands in both the North and South Atlantic Oceans would often be these uninhabited, uncolonized islands that didn't have many natural resources. It meant that one of the few good uses they had was being a temporary base for ships that would fish and whale hunt in the waters around it. 
So naturally, someone who spent time on a whaling ship would be one of the few people to at least be somewhat familiar with islands like Tristan. Admittedly, it's not quite known when Lambert first landed on Tristan. He claimed to have visited the island briefly in 1805, but in the journey of claiming the islands for himself, he landed on Tristan on January 6, 1811 with two men named Thomas Curie and a man simply known as William. His superior, Captain Lovell, was off visiting another island at this time. Apparently, Lambert had many random discussions about his adventure along the way, because not long after, two men named Benjamin Seaver and Andrew Millet joined upon hearing the rumors. The men settled on the island and cleared 50 acres of land to grow a variety of things, ranging from corn and potatoes to sugarcane and coffee plants. So I guess it's a little understandable why they decided to rename the island of Tristan to the Isle of Refreshment. After Captain Lovell made another stop to see how things were going, he eventually left them to their own devices on the island. And on February 4th, 1911, Jonathan Lambert decided to formally declare absolute possession of the island, as well as the rest of the archipelago, and he justified it on the basis of Terra Nullis. Basically, no one was there who could dispute his claim, past or present, which, fair enough. This was a common justification Europeans used for colonial claims at the time, and in this case, there wasn't even an indigenous population to inconveniently ignore. So it's arguably more legitimate. Naturally, Lambert needed a title, so Jonathan went with Lord and Prince of the Islands of Refreshment. He sent word of his declaration back home to the United States, and it would be published across the summer of 1911 in multiple publications and newspapers. It was even published all the way in the UK in London's Morning Chronicle, right below some random story about a race attended by the Duke of York. Jonathan Lambert also made his own flag for this new country. General reactions from the American or British public were mixed, some people were rolling their eyes and scoffing at this weirdo who decided to do this. Other people were slightly amused and even charmed. After all, people love a good adventure. Neither the American nor British governments recognized his claim, but they didn't really do much about it either. News from the island would take forever to arrive, but every once in a while there would be stories published about the agricultural success on the island. But that was really about it. At some point, Benjamin Seaver left the island to try and get investment for further building upon the profitability of the island. He went from places ranging from Cape Town to Rio de Janeiro to Buenos Aires, but used shady means such as implying the settlement was under British protection or sponsorship when it really wasn't. So he got into trouble, and his grift didn't work out. All it did was ultimately cause the British Navy to be a little more concerned. Meanwhile, on May 17th of 1812, Lord and Prince Lambert, along with Millet and Williams, apparently drowned when going out fishing. This meant Thomas Curie was by himself on the island. Since Lambert didn't have a successor, you could mark this as the first possible date of the end of this micronation. Or I guess you could say it's like a rump state. News of this didn't even break out until all the way in 1814 and this just made the British want to settle matters even quicker. But they were kind of distracted with the whole Napoleon thing in Europe and the War of 1812 in America, so it still took a while. On August 14th of 1816, the British finally came in and took over the archipelago. Aside from Lambert being dead and therefore making the claim null and void, the British further justified their presence by wanting to make sure the French didn't take the island. Napoleon was exiled to the island of St. Helena further north, and there was paranoia that the French would take the island and use it as a base to possibly break out Napoleon at some point in the future. Which I find hilarious, but considering what happened during Napoleon's first exile, I kind of understand their paranoia. Thomas Curie, who was still on the island when the British got there, gave his testimony on his time on the island to British officials, and we don't know much more about him after that. The main island was renamed back to Tristan, and the British have possessed the archipelago ever since. And now there are a little over 250 people who live on the main island of Tristan. While Jonathan Lambert's attempt at a micronation is hardly the only one, it is one of the more fascinating and somewhat charming ones due to the way it captured the imaginations of some people at the time. British author Charles Dickens notably called the attempted nation an oddity with a darling flag. Some also imagined Jonathan Lambert as a pirate-like figure, which inspired its own set of rumors. One such rumor was that either Lambert or Thomas Curie had buried treasure somewhere on the island. However, no such treasure was ever found or confirmed to have existed. And once those rumors were squashed, the people generally moved on and the memory about this random adventure kind of faded. But nevertheless, it's a fun, exciting part of this island's history. Thanks for watching the video, and once again, special thanks to the sponsor Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus. Remember to get the game through the link below.